Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's Knowledge, Knowledge Network session. Today, we have Ralph Stewart. Ralph is a certified industrial hygienist and is a chemical hygiene officer. He has managed laboratory health and safety programs at Cornell and the University of Vermont. He is currently the membership chair of the Division of Chemical Health and Safety of the American Chemical Society. He has previously served as the CHAS chair, program chair, the president of the Campus Consortium for Environmental Excellence, and is on the editorial board for the Journal of Chemical Health and Safety. He has received numerous awards and has been named to the Shima Hall of Fame. Ralph holds a bachelor's degree in geology from Cornell University and a master's in environmental, health, engin, environmental engineering from the University of Vermont. Please join me in welcoming Ralph as we begin our conversation on COVID-19 and classroom ventilation. Hi, Ralph. Good morning. How are so, you today? Um, I'm going to talk about today some of the work we've been doing at Keene State College. I, I'm the, currently the environmental safety manager and chemical hygiene officer at Keene State, which is a small college, liberal arts college in the southwest corner of New Hampshire. Uh, we have about 3,000 students, but the secret that we have is that we have about 300 uh, environmental uh, health and safety uh, majors, and undergraduate majors, it's one of the larger undergraduate health and safety majors in the country. And so I get to work with uh, students, undergraduate students on, on very practical pro problems. And this is an interesting example of that, that opportunity. Uh, we have been looking at the ventilation uh, of our classrooms in, on campus and trying to assess if we can, uh, how we can best assess COVID risk concerns uh, associated with classrooms. And so that's what I'm going to go over uh, today. The project uh, started last fall. Um, so obviously COVID hit last spring. Uh, there was a lot of uh, confusion, a lot of uh, hesitation about exactly the best way to manage the situation. Uh, the fundamental challenge is that we have what would be considered a biosafety level three agent ubiquitous in the environment now. Uh, the COVID uh, that virus is, uh, respira is, can, is transmissible through respiration, and that in the traditional laboratory setting anyway, that would be considered a BSL-3 agent. When I was at Cornell, we had about 4,000 laboratories. We had about 1,500 bio laboratories. We had 12 BSL-3 laboratories. And there's a very significant difference between a standard bio, 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 biological laboratory and a BSL-3 laboratory. It has to be designed from the ground up to be a BSL-3 laboratory. And obviously no campuses uh, in the country or in the world probably built their classrooms to be BSL-3 rooms. So we began to think about how do we manage this risk associated with COVID transmission, particularly in classrooms, uh, given the architecture and the engineering that we have inherited uh, from 100 years of campus operations. Um, fortunately for me, my work at Cornell, in, in addition to looking at BSL-3 laboratories, I looked at a wide variety of chemistry laboratories, all sorts of laboratories. Cornell has an extremely diverse group of sciences uh, laboratories. And so um, we got, I got to see a lot of different settings and our, my primary work at Cornell was to develop a control banding system for laboratories to uh, identify which laboratories could handle uh, higher level ventilations or routine level ventilations or specialized ventilations in order to conserve energy. So the work I did at Cornell directly plays into the work I'm gonna to describe today. We are basically trying to divide our, our classrooms into three groups, well-ventilated classrooms, moderately ventilated classrooms, and poorly ventilated classrooms. The reason we were doing this is uh, I think Keene State followed pretty much what everybody else did in the country. The first thing we did when we came back for the fall is reduce the uh, occupancy levels of our classrooms. We reduced the occupancy levels to about 38% of what they were uh, in 2019. Uh, in order to enable six feet distancing between students in the classroom. Uh, we started investing in in-room air cleaners, uh, HEPA filters that could be uh, used to reduce the amount of particles in the air. 
and we began to think about uh, our classroom uh, scheduling practices, specifically the idea of back to back to back to back classes in the same classroom, uh, raised concerns about the inability of the ventilation system, some ventilation systems to clear the air between classes. So we decided to look at all those issues uh, as part of this work. From uh, my own personal experience, uh, working in, a, in an academic setting and as well as talking to colleagues, it's that when COVID hit, just having data in general to go off of um, and make help you make decisions on what do we need to reduce the class size to, what is the appropriate um, scenario for each kind of lab or, or classroom setting, um, that was something that I think people struggled with a lot because typically when we're making judgments as EHS professionals, we're gathering data. And if the data is not there, especially with COVID-19, that makes it extremely, uh, I would say, exhausting to a point to, to do your job. Um, so I think this is a really interesting um, idea. Well, that, that's one part of it. The other part of it is that you may remember last year at this time, there was a lot of spe uh, speculation, both scientifically, but also politically, but also technically, but also at the public level and what the best approach to controlling the transmission of COVID was. And um, it depended a lot, the, the advice that people generated depended a lot on what their personal uh, expertise was. So chemists and medical people and engineers and EHS professionals and uh, politicians all had different perspectives on the same question. And so there was a lot of conflicting advice going back and forth. So what happened at Keene State is we sort of gave up. <laughs> we said, okay, we're just not holding, we're not holding classes after spring break. We closed down. I was teaching uh, a class at that point. We, you know, the whole second half of the semester, we just did it by Zoom. Uh, it was a sudden change in the way I was teaching, uh, obviously, between the yeah. classroom and Zoom. And it was a real stressor for everybody. Uh, and then we took the summer to sort of think about what we had learned uh, during the spring break. Uh, and I said, these, these are the three key, key items we came up with, decreasing the occupancy, uh, getting air cleaners into rooms, and evaluating concerns about overscheduling. So as I said, there, there are many different technical perspectives on the question, and I come at it as a certified industrial hygienist. Industrial hygienists think about ventilation in a variety of different ways. We recognize that ventilation systems are designed with competing interests in mind. Uh, mm -hmm. Fundamentally, the standard approach to uh, building a ventilation system is number one, control temperature in the space. So, you know, ASHRAE has its standards for uh, comfort zones uh, that you need to hit uh, to have 80% of the population happy with the space they're in. And they're talking about temperature and humidity um, uh, restrictions. Um, I think it's 68 to 74. It's a pretty narrow band actually. So uh, ventilation systems are number one, built to control that. Number two, they control odors. So when you have an occupied space, you have people breathing, you have people sweating, you have people working. Uh, they create uh, odors and the primary control around that is just provide lots of air and dilute those odors away. And number three, since about 1990, we, the, all the ventilation designs have really focused on energy costs. And so okay. there's a competition between those values uh, as a design energy, as a design engineer builds a particular building. So this may be jumping ahead, but mm -hmm. in terms of uh, COVID, was there any, in, in those three competing ideas, was there any one in particular that, that really kind of pushed forward as like, this is going to be more important um, as we address our COVID issues? Yes, yeah. uh, <laughs> in, in, in a very complex way. So the, 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 the fundamental challenge that every campus faces is that its buildings are built over time and every building is a unique story unto itself. And I think that was the challenge we faced in 2020 is a lot of the advice that was coming out was based on your laboratory studies of a very specific scenario or on uh, very generic advice from the various uh, authorities in the field like OSHA, ASHRAE, uh, ACGIH all had advice coming out, but their advice was not specific enough to be actionable. And so, like you said before, data is how you turn advice into action. And uh, because of my experience at Cornell, I had a lot of 
experience in uh, collecting the data about specific rooms, but very few campuses have that, that luxury. I also have the luxury of having a lot of free labor to help me do the work. And I also have uh, a little bit more time because in addition to having a, a 10 faculty in the safety department, we also have a president who is a former faculty member in the safety department. And so I was not put in the position of having to advocate for uh, best practices when it came to COVID protection. The president was already committed to that as a safety professional. She recruited a, the chair of the, fac, of the safety department to be her primary technical consultant. Uh, I was not the project manager. I know that many EHS offices were all of a sudden dumped on with many different uh, responsibilities that they were not staffed for, that they were not technically prepared for. And mm -hmm. so um, I was in a very luxurious position of being able to focus, since I'm in the physical plant department at Keene State, I was able to focus on our buildings. I did not have to deal with student behavior issues. I did not have to deal with, uh, uh, well, I do deal with PPE management uh, for campus, but um, I had very broad uh, outline of how to do that. So um, I did have time to really think about ventilation and move forward and how what the role of that was. So as I said, the ventilation system is built to control very specific things. It also does not control very specific things. So industrial hygienists spend a lot of time, are actually are the origins of industrial hygiene are in dusty environments. If you read some of the early literature, it's about dusty environments. It's about silica dust. It's about lead dust. It's about um, enamel in, uh, in factories that build bathtubs. Uh, so we have a lot of interest and experience in dealing with particles in the air. The viruses is going to, are going to travel more like particles than they are like gas molecules. They're too big to act like gas molecules. molecules. And we know, industrial hygienists know, that uh, particles generated in the room are not controlled by dilution ventilation. Direction, uh, direction is of the air movement is as important as how, many, how much the air, the air is moving. And so uh, in general, uh, very uh, takes a BSL-3 laboratory design to actually think about, for the engineer to think about how particles move inside the space. Um, it's, it's not part of the design process. And like I said, there, there's no public spaces that are BSL-3. Well, that's, there are in the hospitals, they do have BSL-3 style ventilation systems for specific rooms. But I think that was one of the high stress points last year at this time is that the uh, hospitals did not have enough of those spaces to handle the, the patient volume they were facing. So in general- I pictures of, of, um, of, you know, the uh, medical technologists really having to gear up quite heavily in PPE at the time uh, because they're working at, you know, just a clean bench and that's all they had access to in their hospitals. Right, and the patient care situations too. They were putting, you know, infectious COVID patients in in average rooms, and so the particle of the COVID. I remember they had a lot of pictures of patients who were uh, garbed in PPE, not to protect the person, but to protect the the people around them, and uh, that that was sort of one of the things that I don't think many non-industrial hygienists appreciated about the situation is that the ventilation system was just not part of the solution. The good news, or I don't know if the good news, the other aspect of this from an industrial hygiene point of view is that ventilation practices have evolved a lot over the last 30 years, because as I said, since about 1990, we've been reducing the amount of fresh air supplied to spaces to control energy costs. And that has led to a lot of indoor air quality problems. And Many industrial hygienists of my generation, I started in, as an industrial hygienist in 1985, we spent 10 or 15 years just working through many, many, many indoor air quality problems on whatever organization that we were working with. Office spaces, laboratories, uh, shops, people had concerns about odors, about symptoms, about a wide variety of things. And it took us a long time to develop a standard method for approaching um, indoor air quality problems. And the good news at, at this point is that one of the key lessons we learned in that process was about communication. We had learned how to, that we have to communicate with the occupants in on an ongoing way. 
in a two-way format. We have to hear from them what their concerns are. We have to explain to them how we can address those concerns. And sometimes we can address those concerns fairly simply by rearranging offices or uh, identifying a source. Other times we have to rebuild the building. I have been through several adventures where we ended up rebuilding the, the building to address indoor air quality problems that presented uh, significant concerns. So um, just like every campus, Keene State has a le legacy, uh, mixture, a legacy of modern ventilation systems. Uh, Keene State was established in 1909. We still have the original building on campus and we have a building from 2015. So we have every possible <laughs> uh, ventilation system that you've seen over the last hundred years on campus. And we have to address each one in a very specific way. Makes sense. I know I the university I worked worked for previously. Every time you walked into a building, there were tips and tricks on how to understand the ventilation system and how even just um, the engineering controls in the in the building worked differently depending on what year it was built. Um, and it was always okay. Which building am I going to? Let me grab the checklist for that one in yes, particular. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, over the summer, we began thinking through how are we going to. Uh, have a class, have a have an academic year under COVID, and basically this is a system we came up with at Keene State, and I think it's pretty common uh, with variations across the country. Uh, our primary control is at testing uh, individuals to screen out infected individuals. So uh, all fall we had uh, everybody on campus, staff, faculty, students uh, were tested once a week. Um, through November, it wasn't too bad. We weren't getting very many hits. November hits started hearing uh, uh, a lot more people started uh, testing positive, primarily students, primarily students who lived off campus uh, because uh, habits off campus are a little different than habits on campus. Uh, we delayed opening in the spring uh, because we were very concerned about the holiday season. So we closed down uh, class the classes uh, at Thanksgiving, we didn't open again until February 15th because we wanted to let the, um, the virus uh, work its way through the population over the holidays. Um, and now this semester we are testing, still testing faculty and staff once a week. We are testing students twice a week. Uh, our numbers did go up for a while. They're coming back down now. Um, I forget what the, the most recent number is. But we are really focusing on just like any good industrial hygienist. We have an industrial hygienist as president. Just like any good industrial hygienist, our our, our first priority is source control. So um, we are identifying people. We are uh, supporting them through quarantine and isolation periods uh, to continue participating in class uh, virtually. But we are very uh, focused on this idea of testing individuals and re reducing the hazard that way. Our secondary control, as I said before, in classrooms, we, re we reduced uh, capacities. So we have six foot distancing between each uh, student in class. As I walk through classrooms uh, or through the hallways of our class buildings uh, on a routine basis, just to see how people are complying with that. There is a lot of compliance with it. Many faculty are um, talking to themselves in front of a Zoom screen because uh, there's only one or two or maybe even zero. I guess the faculty can decide how many they want, uh, how many students they want in the room uh, as opposed to operating virtually because um, there are a lot of faculty who are in risk groups that uh, COVID is a concern for. So physical distancing is our secondary control. And then our tertiary control, our third level control is mask wearing for near, near field exposure. So if you're within six feet of somebody, uh, ventilation is not gonna make any difference. Uh, you know, there's no way a ventilation system can capture any viruses that are, are within six feet of another person. That's where we're really focusing on mask wearing. And then uh, for far field situations, uh, we're thinking about ventilation, uh, supplying fresh air to a space and cleaning the air that's in the space already through HEPA filters. Uh, air cleaning units. Um, again, my experience over the last year has been that there's been a lot of confusion about the three different levels of control, how they interact with each other. They they work as a system. They don't. None of them works by themselves. Each one has uh, strengths and weaknesses, but depending on an individual's personal 
technical background, they might focus on one or the other of these. And um, it's been an interesting challenge in communication to help people understand how things connect with each other. And I imagine um, with with these varying, you know, levels of expertise, and and again, this this came up recently as well. It's it's really taking the approach of, like you said before, you're in a very lucky situation where you have very safety conscious leadership at your your university. Um, but there are other EHS professionals who are are having to reach out for the first time to their medical um, leaders and their um, you know, biosafety, you know, industrial hygienists having to work hand in hand uh, with these other leaders to really kind of put forth this team effort so that they can address all of these things in a, a reasonable um, a, and productive way. Yeah, it, it's, it is, I talked to colleagues on their campuses where the team approach was more of a challenge than, the value, than an asset. And yeah. Um, yeah, it's something I think people have learned over time, but, um, Given the high stakes for everybody in both the at the individual level of not wanting to be sick and at the institutional level of wanting to stay in business, there, mm -hmm. there's a lot of opinions about um, the best way to move forward. And this is what we've done at Keene State. It's worked pretty well. Our numbers are uh, our infected numbers of infected students are much lower than for the other two campuses in uh, that have school have classes going on in the, in the New Hampshire system. Um, so I think, but we, we also had the luxury of having a fairly small campus and a fairly, uh, the, the, our buildings, I was pleasantly surprised when I got to Keene State that our buildings have been well maintained over the years. We still have um, buildings that are legacy buildings, but in general, there's been significant renovation to almost all of our buildings in the last 10 years. Well, not in the last 10 years, last 20 years. And we have fairly modern systems. There's a few buildings that don't have that in place, but the most of our buildings uh, are pretty well on the net modern ventilation systems. So the Swiss cheese model I showed on the previous slide uh, alludes to the fact that there are holes in any particular layer of protection. And this particular slide uh, starts thinking about how, what are the layers in the, the holes in the ventilation layer? So moving forward, um, we expect uh, ongoing concerns around COVID for, we don't know, years, probably years that we'll have to be considering COVID. And uh, that means that the ventilation system is gonna need to be on, uh, continuously evaluated for how it's uh, managing particles in particular. And so there's three key concerns I'm, I'm aware of in the ventilation system. Number one, as I mentioned before, airborne particles move differently than gases. Gases move by diffusion and uh, in a fairly predictable way. And you can uh, expect them to uh, be well mixed in a room uh, in general. Uh, when I do CO2 studies for occupancy uh, in classrooms, uh, I don't see a lot of difference between one side of the classroom and the other. With particles, that's not the case. I see once, uh, depending on where the particle releases, uh, very specific areas of the room will be, have many more particles than other areas of the room. So that's the number one challenge. Uh, so related to that challenge is what we're concerned about is super spreader events. So some of the most famous uh, super spreader events are situations where an infectious individual who doesn't know that they are infectious uh, is in a public setting that is upwind of other people. So the ventilation system has air blowing past the infectious individual to other individuals. And in those situations, you can have dozens of people become infected, particularly if they're there for a period of time, an hour, an hour and a half, like they may be a, if they were at a dinner or something. Um, so uh, in those situations, uh, infectious individuals may create or may be part of a super spreader event. That, um, that the ventilation system uh, helped make happen uh, the, just by the direction of the air movement in the room. And then the third uh, possibility is that if there is not a lot of air exchange in the room uh, to move the virus particles, then uh, the, link, the virus particles can stay in the air for a significant amount of time. Uh, doesn't appear that we know very much yet about where the what size the virus particles are. The viruses themselves are pretty small, but they're often attached to either liquid 
uh, particles or solid particles and how the particles move can depend a lot on the size and the shape and all sorts of other aspects of the part of the particle that it's attached to. So we, there's a lot of interesting questions, which until 2020 were theoretical questions. And now they're very practical questions about how can the ventilation system control uh, particles in there. You mentioned that we're going to have to deal with COVID uh, for quite some time, for a number of years. Uh, but I imagine that all of the data you're collecting for COVID and, and classroom air quality um, also applies to other viruses as well. Um, you know, I've had conversations again where uh, it's much different than, you know, two years ago, if you had the flu or onset of flu, some people still they didn't think twice about going into the office to work uh, with the flu and not wearing any kind of mask or PPE. Um, but now that's really changed with COVID. Um, you know, you're not allowed to come into work whatsoever with a fever or temperature, and, and there's a lot more strict, uh, there's a lot more restrictions uh, when it comes to, to going to work sick. And so I imagine that, that this, this research that you're doing is also going to apply to other viruses as well in terms of how you deal with it, how you look at air, uh, indoor air quality um, and, and classroom ventilation for, for quite some time for broader applications as well. All right. Yes. And that's a really interesting challenge because uh, people do have a very um, design engineers have a very set specific set of criteria, which I described before. And if we add to that criteria part <laughs> infection control, that's going to change a lot of, well, it's going to change a lot of things, but it's going to change a lot of budgets and a lot of timelines for installation of new systems. So in addressing those different uh, concerns about the holes in the Swiss cheese, uh, there's three strategies I'm taking to assess those three hazards. Number one, um, trying to understand how the air, the direction of air movement in, in our classroom spaces, as well as the speed. So I'm very specifically focusing on classrooms because that's our most public space where random people come and go the most. I don't haven't done this kind of work in their dorms or our office spaces because well, number one, uh, time, uh, we, you know, just doing this for, uh, I've been doing this for about five months uh, for classrooms. Uh, and I'm trying to develop a more streamlined approach for other spaces. But for now, uh, we're strictly, I'm strictly focusing on classrooms. Uh, so I have to figure out how, what direction air is moving in classrooms. And again, this is very specific, not only to the building, but also to each room within the building because each, well, many build, buildings have different shaped classrooms. So the shape of the classroom makes a big difference in the direction of the air moving in the, in the classroom. Uh, secondly, on the in terms of uh, super spreader concerns of infectious individuals, we try to minimize air turbulence. So having turbulent air means that the uh, particles in the air are gonna uh, move very unpredictably. Uh, they may move in a very specific direction towards a uh, uh, vulnerable target, or they may move in a very random collection direction and just spread across the whole, whole classroom. So if you have a person who is infectious, who's sneezing in the classroom, depending on where they are within the, the direction, directionality of the space, um, they may be a super spreader, they may be not a super spreader, they, everybody may get it, nobody may get it. And then the third uh, hole, uh, we're trying to provide clearance time between classrooms to uh, between classes so that classrooms are not used back to back to back. And in fact, we've established uh, for the fall semester that we're going to have an hour at lunch and an hour at dinner when classes will not be held at Keene State, just so we have a clearance time for all of our classrooms. Uh, we're providing HEPA filters, uh, HEPA air cleaners, and we have used ionization air cleaning technologies in a few spaces where we couldn't use HEPA air cleaners. And I'm monitoring CO2 levels on a daily basis uh, in our classroom buildings to identify potential problem areas. So this is uh, how we're collecting the data and a useful, trying to convert it into useful information for upper management. We organize our buildings into poorly ventilated spaces, moderately ventilated spaces, and well ventilated spaces. Our well ventilated spaces have all been, um, well, the top three have all been re uh, renovated over the last 10 to 15 years. We have good control of uh, the ventilation system. We can re, we 
immediately swapped out before we opened classes again. We immediately swapped out to MERV 13 filters in the space. Uh, we could we we uh, left them in 100% fresh air as much as possible. Uh, the moderately ventilated spaces include uh, older ventilation systems or more modern ones, like the living learning um, space is a modern, that's a 2015 building, but because it was built for LEED standards, it doesn't have very much air going into it. So okay. it's interesting that, um, that modern spaces have limitations on ventilation that are different than some slightly older spaces. And then we have the legacy buildings, the poorly ventilated buildings or the legacy buildings, which are uh, built in 1950s, 19, and some of these are original and just uh, had have space heaters in the space, they don't even have a ventilation system. And so those are the ones that we really focus on in terms of providing air cleaning and other uh, strategies too. It's interesting when you have just, um, just space heaters, how, how you're, going to have to pay attention to those areas much more um, because to me that's kind of it, it I guess so being from Florida you know <laughs> every building having an AC system and things like that but I imagine in New Hampshire it's not a requirement um, no. to have you know an AC uh, system it doesn't get nearly as hot uh, but but yeah so I just I, I think my mind is kind of just thinking about all of the things that that you would have to do to make sure that that space is safe and clean um, especially I imagine timing between when those classes started and ended was key as well mm -hmm. um, just to make sure that you had time to clean and, and you know, even just, just let uh, things kind of settle a little bit. Well, if you note down here, uh, these two buildings are our legacy buildings with no ventilation system. When the windows are open, they're very mm -hmm. well ventilated. And so <laughs> September, October, September and October last semester, we I have very few concerns about ventilation. You know, we there in 10 or 12 air changes. But when you get to February, March, these two buildings go over to this co column because they have to keep the windows closed for to protect, you know, the building. And you don't want it to be 30, 32 degrees inside the building. So no. um, I although, think that's out of your window of comfort controls. <laughs> <laughs> Except Joslyn uh, is so overheated by the rate, the system is so, the radiators are so old and clunky that they get to 85 no matter what you do. So it, every building has its own story is the key point here. And I, you can see that I, I'm very fortunate and I have an assortment of about 15 buildings here that I'm focusing on. Most campuses, you're looking at 75 to 100 buildings. Uh, if you're talking just about classroom buildings, if you add dorms, you can get up to the 200 building range for a larger campus. I'm not sure how I would approach this kind of work in those sets in those settings. I have ideas, but I don't know exactly how if it would work or not. Yeah, and I think that's kind of one of that was going to be one of my questions is coming from a large university. I can it would it would be wonderful to have this this kind of information, especially timing wise, right? Like windows open, it's fine, you know, and then windows close, it moves this area. Um, so how would how would somebody who maybe comes from a, a university that doesn't have any idea how would how would you even begin to recommend they get started in gathering this kind of information? So um, when I was at Cornell, uh, we produced we the group I was working with wrote we wrote three papers about the work we were doing there, and this was uh, control banding for laboratories for chemical laboratories and. We came up with a process uh, based on a lot of research, both literature research and physical research in different rooms. And we came up with a process of control banding that was based on three criteria. So we would walk into a laboratory, we would look at the chemistry going on in the laboratory. The intended chemistry, you know, is it an organic lab? It's obviously very different from a biochemistry lab, it's very different from an engineering lab. And so you look at the chemistry, what's the chemical inventory? Is it uh, is the, do they have appropriate and adequate uh, fume hood space, uh, flammable storage cabinets, all that kind of stuff. So get a sense of the chemistry, number one. And if uh, we felt like it was a chemistry that was manageable, okay, so that was our first criteria. Our second criteria was um, the shape of the room and the ventilation effectiveness. So basically we did about 60 or 70 rooms where we went in and did the CO2 testing that I, I just described in another paper. Um, 
and got a sense of how that the, those of us who are doing the work could sort of intuitively develop a professional judgment about this room is likely to be well ventilated, effect effectively ventilated throughout, or there may be dead spots in the room. That was really the question. And then the third piece was housekeeping. <laughs> you know, that laboratory, some laboratories are very strict about their housekeeping practices and other laboratories, not so much. And so you could walk into a laboratory in a minute and a half, uh, identify housekeeping issues. And so those three concerns helped us determine is a six, is this, should this laboratory for chemical purposes have six air changes an hour or eight air changes an hour? And what we found is that we could do about 80% of the labs could have six air changes an hour, uh, but the 20% that needed eight air changes an hour were totally unpredictable. We would be walking through a uh, food sciences building and um, we, you know, be saying six and six and six, and then all of a sudden you walk into this room and there's a faculty member who's trying all sorts of new stuff with all sorts of weird chemistry. And it's just totally different from everything else that's going on in the building. And he needs eight year changes in an hour. And so um, you have to do, what I learned is you have to do a, you can't just say, well, this building is biology. It's not gonna be a problem. There's always a biologist who's heavily duty into very exotic chemistry and you have to visit their lab and help and get a sense of both the, the chemistry, the housekeeping and the ventilation effectiveness of the space in order to make a determination. Now in the COVID world, we're talking about particles, not chemicals. We have to think about a different approach to this. And this is the beginnings. This is the kind of uh, research I was doing at, at Cornell for chemicals. This is, a, this is the way I approach it at Keene State when it comes to particles in classrooms. Um, so that's, that's sort of where the inspiration for this work came from. Okay. Well, and I guess maybe we'll get to this, um, later on and maybe I should save this question for later, but it's, it's on my mind now yeah. is with these buildings. And we've talked about the var um, virus particles, you know, m are very different than gas particles that would be kind of centrally located to, to a certain area of the room. Um, rather than kind of evenly spread across. Did you have any situations where you felt like you needed, you could, you know, better prepare faculty and things like that, where you could move desks or move uh, maybe even like podiums where they were speaking? Um, I didn't know if you, you had approached that in any of these spaces as well. We haven't gotten to that level of detail yet at Keene okay. State. Uh, we did run into a couple situations at Cornell where that specifically came up and it was based around air movement in laboratories that were surprises because the fume hoods were put in such a place that they sucked essentially all the air in their neighborhood to get into them. And so they, uh, there was an odor problem and they said, well, it's right next to the fume hood. It shouldn't be a problem, right? The fume hood is capturing it. The fume hood does not capture anything that's not inside the fume hood very well. And so we did some testing and we showed that the air movement in that particular laboratory went avo essentially avoided, <laughs> avoided the, the source of the order. And just because of the way the, rain, the shape of the room and the way it was laid out. So um, you're, you're one step ahead of me in that, that that's it. And it is interesting as we do the work in at Keene State is that podiums do seem to be sort of and for it makes sense, they're sort of the center point of the room, right? And they do seem to be the center point of the ventilation system as well. Uh, we haven't identified what we how we responded to that actually is sort of in the next slide here. So I mentioned we're optimizing our class schedule by reviewing class occupancies and reducing back-to-back -back scheduling, but we also put out about a hundred air filters. So we have a universe of probably I would say in terms of 75 to 80 classrooms on campus that we're, we're monitoring. Uh, I knew early last year, about this time in last year, that air cleaners were going to be important. They were also very scarce at that point. So we, uh, we bought 50 of them uh, for specific classrooms on campus, including the child care center. So we have a, a daycare center with, uh, well, this year they're running at half capacity, um, but with a lot of stu uh, kids in there. So they were a high priority for protection. Uh, we have a, a very uh, active music department and they have, uh, so they have a lot of spaces where they're singing and playing. Now, obviously they 
uh, social, uh, physically distanced distance their practices. They would go outside as much as possible to practice. But um, we put a lot of air cleaners into their spaces. And then the low ventilated, naturally ventilated buildings uh, are places where we put the air cleaners. So those were our top priority for the air cleaners to go in. Uh, then over break, uh, over the uh, fall uh, semester break, we had been able to get 50 more uh, air cleaners. We put them into our other classrooms um, for, uh, for uh, to control particle counts there. Um, again, this is similar to what I was just explaining about the Cornell chemistry lab situation. Keene State, the question is not what the airflow needs to be, but is how many air cleaners do you need in the room? Okay. So some of our some of our classrooms have two, some have three, some have four. Can't if you get more than four, you're running into noise problems. So we have very specific. Uh, we go we go and look at the room. We look at what's available, how how it might impact noise, and we based on that we deploy. Yeah, as I said, we deploy about 100 air filters into about 70 spaces. Fortunately for us, our two biggest. Um, Biggest classroom buildings are modern enough that they don't really benefit from air cleaners. There are a few air cleaners in them on faculty request. So as I said, it's down here. Third, uh, faculty can request classroom uh, air cleaners. I provide that. I go and look at the classroom and if I think there's value added or then I will uh, provide an air cleaner for them. And so uh, the data on whether air cleaners make a difference from a risk point of view when it comes to COVID virus is not entirely clear because uh, HEPA filters are very good for cleaning air coming into a space, but they're, once the source, of, the source of the problem is not the air coming in, it's the air that's in there if there's an infectious individual, right? Yeah. And so uh, if that infectious individual doesn't have to be next to an air cleaner, it may not make any difference to that the hazard, the risk level in that particular uh, room. I mentioned we, we do have some ionization units as well. Um, the data on them is even less convincing, but there are certain situations, the recital hall, the music recital hall, um, we just could not provide enough air cleaners, you know, un air cleaning units to put in there. Uh, the ionization unit we put into the ventilation system to try to uh, alleviate that. I haven't seen a lot of data that convinces me either in the literature or at Keene State that convinced me that ionization units are doing a lot for us. So that that's sort of yeah. the, the system that's developing now is based on air cleaners in spaces. And then uh, the additional unit, the other thing we're doing is monitoring CO2 levels. So CO2 tells us about the occupancy level, how many people are in the space relative to the amount of ventilation they're getting in there from out of fresh air. You can see classes happen and the ventilation goes up. There are always, uh, these particular rooms are about below 600, which are pretty low. Um, CO2, anything over a thousand is when people start getting nervous about it. But the key point here is that um, the, these are the, the particle numbers for the same classrooms at the same time. And to me, I don't see a lot of correspondence between the number of particles in the space and the number of people in the space. No. A lot, they, they are not really well connected. We've been working the numbers to try to figure out if we, how do we, um, is, is there a correlation between CO2 and particles? Is there a way to, what's the best way to measure the particles given that we don't know which of these particle sizes. So this is 10 microns, five, mi uh, one micron, two and a half microns. We don't know which of these are most likely to contain a virus, an infectious particle. So how do we assess the risk associated with more people in the room if CO2 and particle size do not correspond to each other? Yeah. And, and I think that's really interesting is, is that you don't see, you, you still see an influx of inf in the various particle sizes, even when there's low occupancy in in these classrooms, so and I and I and I can start to gather that, um, I mean, right in a research controlled lab, you could maybe find a way to tag the virus and see how it traveled and things like that. In a classroom setting, this is really not an option. Um, so I'm wondering if there uh, have do you have any guesses as to what would better tie? 
um, to deciding how to measure these virus particles? That's, that's the million dollar question right there. Uh, so we are planning on having fall semester. So we were planning students coming back to fall semester full force where we will, whether we will be able to maintain the testing program I described, mm -hmm. given the financial need, you know, the financial requirements to maintain the testing program. Uh, so right now, these particles, we are, I'm pretty confident they're not infectious, right? Because we don't have individual, we don't have infectious individual on campus. We, we know who they are, we get them off campus. If we don't do infection, if we don't do testing of the population, these are potentially infectious. And so being in the classroom on this day is a whole lot worse than being in the classroom on this day. And, yeah. um, you know, I don't see, I don't see patterns yet in the, the um, I mean, there, if you compare classroom to classroom to classroom, you can see sort of common sense patterns that, uh, for example, the having air filters and air cleaners in a room will cut down the length of time for the particles to return to decay back to background by about a half. So it's usually about an hour okay. for a um, for particles to return to background. Uh, in general, it's about a half hour, and this is obviously lots of curly cues and disclaimers around this, but. Sort of that's where our preliminary data is showing that we can get back to background quicker when we have air cleaners in the room, um, which makes sense. But um, it's you know it's very specific to the, those data is very specific to the room in case it's not a, a principle yet. Uh, given that, um, and, and this is kind of going back to that uh, measurement, um, you know, given that that the virus likely travels through like aerosol. Or you know even on, on liquid particles, I think I've seen that that research as well. Would it be helpful to measure, you know, water vapor or things like that in the air as well, or, or is that kind of? That's an interesting issue as well. Um, there is speculation. I haven't seen data, but there is speculation that a COVID virus will survive longer in drier air. And um, in New England, in the winter, we our classrooms tend to be about 10% relative humidity, between five and 10%, because you're taking outdoor air, you're heating it up, and you're delivering it at 70 degrees when it was 20 degrees outside. Yeah. So um, it's very dry air, and the very dry air is where the people are, you know, where the potentially infectious individual is, and so COVID may be happier there. Um, so humidity. Is interesting, but it's very hard to control. At UVM and at Cornell, both there's a lot of concern about hum humidity control for animal rooms. It's very difficult to do. I don't know what the situation is in Florida. You can probably get up to forty percent humidity <laughs> in January. You can't do it in Vermont or Vermont or Ithaca. I think it's hundred percent humidity all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, so um, yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of moving variables here. I saw yesterday in the paper that there is a commercial product coming out to collect and analyze COVID particles in uh, in the environment. Uh, they did not, it was not a, a product yet. It was just a, a technology that's in development and they didn't mention any prices associated with it. I imagine the collection device may not be all that expensive, but I imagine the lab work is fairly expensive. So. Uh, I think I'm hoping that in the next year or two, we have a lot of opportunity to explore these a lot further now that the uh, value of this, both the science and the technical data will become, is a much more clear to everybody. Yeah. What I found really interesting is kind of this, um, and I've noticed this trend throughout my career is, is it, especially at the beginning of my career, um, there was a lot of focus on, you know, translational medicine. So getting bench work, so that it was um, your research focused on, okay, well, what kind of therapies or, or medicine or something like that can you develop from that, this bench research? Um, but I've actually seen kind of the shift, especially with COVID back to, you know, just basic science research, understanding the virus particle, the size, the shape, how it, how it moves and, um, and even things like measuring, uh, 
air quality, you know, these are all basic science research things that, that maybe doesn't translate into medicine, but it does provide tools. And I think that's a really important step for, for scientists and labs and even as EHS professionals that, yeah, it's great to get to the point where you have maybe a lucrative drug that you can sell or something like that. But you really, in order to get to that point and, and provide protection, uh, you really need these, these foundational pieces of, of knowledge uh, to move forward. So I, I think that that shift has been really interesting. And, and just, I think COVID really highlighted that for me in particular. Well, the vaccine is a great example of that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. without all the basic science that has been developed over the last decade, we would not deliver the vaccine in the year. You know, it's just yeah. amazing when you think about it from a scientific point of view. But they still have the benefit in the vaccine case they still have the benefit that they're working with in a very specific culture, uh, medical culture, health, public health culture. Uh, mm -hmm. The COVID situation in the field, you're, you have competing, you know, a science culture, you have an engineering culture, you have a public health culture, you have all these different groups that an industrial hygienist in the EHS field in general work with these people in, on very specific ways. And all of a sudden they're, they're, they may not be comfortable or may not be used to working with each other. Um, they, gain, they gain comfort over time as they understand the limits of their personal expertise and how that impacts other people. But it's a really, it's been fascinating to watch that cultural, those cultural issues arise. Yeah, and I've seen, so I've had several conversations with, with people who work in sustainability. Um, and what I've seen really interesting is sustainability is really, it's still a relatively young career in, in terms of having regulations, you know, set set of regulations or set policies to follow. Um, whereas safety, it, it really is, to me, kind of the foundation of how sustainability can build off of it. And, you know, I even talked about the risk matrix with a, a colleague who, who works in sustainability. And he was like, oh, this is a fantastic way to think about it going forward. And I was, you know, I was like, there's a lot of tools that EHS professionals have developed um, that I think when you start tying in these groups, you can really learn a lot from each other um, and how to approach it because there there is a lot of wide ranging knowledge of it in environmental health and safety professionals. You know, you have your biosafety professionals, you have your industrial hygienists, um, and they they are you, typically they are used to working collaboratively to a certain mm -hmm. extent to solve a problem. Um, and so I think it's a great model of of, of teamwork when it works well. <laughs> um, of how to to solve um, a complex problem with with varying levels of expertise. The other challenge we're seeing in 2020, 2021 is the rush to press. You know, yeah. there's the between the preprints and the Twitterverse and <laughs> the media's scarfing up, you know, a a sentence in a press release that's out of context. Um, there's just the rush to uh, try to proclaim something that if you look at the data is just not there. And um, I think that's something that a lot of people have not really, there's, yeah, that's an ongoing challenge. Yeah, no, I agree. So the closing slide I have is that um, primarily it's important to remember that uh, the ventilation requirement for any particular space depends on how the room is used. A classroom is very different from a lab, is very different from an office. Uh, so there's a lot of um, different ways you can approach a particular room. The challenge is do, does who has the resources to go room by room and come up with the most, uh, the best approach to that. So at Keene State, I'm very fortunate. I have a lot of resources relative to the number of rooms I have and uh, had a lot of support uh, when I need specific equipment or something. I've gotten a lot of support from our upper management to, to get it without asking much about cost. Uh, so, but so that's not always the case. Uh, it's very important to understand, this is the industrial hygienist in me coming out. It's very important to understand the direction of the movement as well as the speed. So, you know, capture velocity is a vector, not a scalar. Uh, it's not just how many and how fast, it's how, where it's moving. Uh, but that means there's no specific ACH air change rate that need, is safe or unsafe. Um, ventilation is just one part of the overall system. You have to uh, make sure that uh, testing, uh, physical distancing, masks are in place 
uh, to provide protection. And I think that's the challenge for fall 2021 in general. You know, it, the public schools, private schools, higher ed, everybody is facing a 20, fall 2021 where the population may be uh, wanting to revert to 1919 or 2019 uh, rather than to 2020. And yeah. that, that's sort of the, the challenge we're gonna face. Yeah, and and kind of wanting to revert back to 2019, it's, um, you know, like you mentioned earlier, it's not something that we're likely going to be able to do uh, for a number of years. Um, especially when we're just getting started with these vaccine uh, rollout phases for everyone uh, and making it more readily available. Um, and I, I had a question on the top of my mind and it just it just left me just now. <laughs> um, well, and, and there's that part of it, then there's a public health part of it where we're seeing all these variations coming out, you know, these variants on the, on the virus and what we know so far is that um, there are difference in transmissibility. The vaccine seems to be pretty robust against the different variants, but the fact that there are differences in transmissibility and also the fact that the flu went away entirely this year. You know, yeah. there was almost no flu, which means that our system was working pretty, you know, the, the prevention system in the field was working pretty well. You know, all the standard transmission uh, pathways were cut off pretty well but um, COVID was still blossoming at that point, right? So there's something about COVID that's different. And even if it does come back to a, some kind of endemic background level, it's an ongoing stress for everybody. Um, so I think I was gonna, I, I remembered where my question was going earlier. Um, so in terms of looking at these, <laughs> maybe large scale classroom buildings and uh, approaching it um, in a more in a more holistic process. So, and I think you mentioned before you have ideas on how you would, you know, tackle uh, larger universities or, you know, larger classroom settings. Um, is I can envision maybe putting together some kind of matrix where you're looking at the, 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 um, the, the, the ventilation system and, and, how old it is and how well it's functioning mm -hmm. and then testing various classrooms. So maybe you pick a classroom on each floor. Um, and then you also take something, um, and, and, a, you know, safety strategies uses, has clients that use this all the time, but, you know, a, a risk assessment, uh, that you can easily run data on and say, okay, I'm going to look at everything that this individual is using, uh, pull that data, and then to just start prioritizing from there, maybe, targeting points of, of interest where you think that there may be higher uh, concerns where um, uh, you'll have, you know, more interaction between uh, individuals, you know, maybe the research is different, they're putting themselves in different situations, um, kind of like you were saying with the, the um, organic chemistry versus biochemistry labs, um, and just kind of creating this matrix um, that you can sort of work through at your university um, to, to pick and choose which classrooms to focus on and then trying to make broader assumptions based off those smaller observations. Yeah, and, and I think the key is not to get over anxious and try to do too much at once. You have to, we, we, we are gonna have to wait for science to develop. Uh, and, um, you know, this is what I've just been showing is fairly tentative, very, specific to Keene State's situation. It's only one part of Keene State. It's only the classroom scene. It's not the office scene. It's not the dorm scene. So, um, and the classroom is probably the easiest of those three because it's the most most uh, well-defined. I have a schedule. I know when people are there. I know how many people are there, you know. But, you know, my experience at Cornell is that you can uh, develop a, like I said, professional judgment about want just wandering buildings identifying this building looks like one that requires more investigation this one uh is not one that's a high priority um you know, like you said you can do that based on data i know that other campuses have a lot more data um available about their buildings and the ventilation system not always easily interchangeable into into the data you need it to be but um 
it, yeah. yeah, so there, there are ways to move forward with this, but um, I think it's going to be a year or two before the, uh, the science is really there to, to tell us which is the most, to me, the import, most important thing is getting a, some kind of uh, relative magnitude of the importance of uh, the different pathways. So whether ventilation is most important or whether near field, uh, near field exposure or far field exposure or surface exposure or home exposure, because that's a very different scenario as well. Um, and it's, that does seem to be the case, at least for our students, is that home exposure is where, where it happens. It's not, uh, it's not in the public that it's, it's you know, when, when we find a, a, if we have seven students uh, who are infectious, it turns out that four of them probably live together. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That makes sense. And I think we've seen that across play out across the news and, yeah. um, you know, numerous times, um, which is, I think, an interesting uh, human experience uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, research as well. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, um, thank you so much for for this presentation and for really for hopping on this call. Um, I found the the topic really interesting. And um, like you said, it's going to be a few years before we have all the data. And so I'm, I'm curious to follow it and to see what other research you you're currently doing, um, to, to get answers. Cause I think, like I said earlier in our call, I really do think that it's going to be something that plays out, um, you know, for other, uh, practices as well. And, and I think I'm, I'm more curious, like you said, when you're, you're talking about design of buildings. Um, if infection control will start to play a heavier role um, and really putting um, environmentalists and safety professionals kind of together and having to figure out kind of a compromise of how do we make our buildings energy efficient, but we also keep our, our, our uh, people safe at the same time. Yeah.